I was pleased to know that the Americans had treated me like they treated their own. Great Britain could not afford such largesse. Even so, we were paid the same as their soldiers. Scotland was so different from America. Each morning, a person from the Ministry of Agriculture gave us job assignments and a bicycle. He pointed on a map where to report for work. He let us know, with some pride, that the first bicycle was designed and built by a Scottish blacksmith and that a Scottish dentist invented the pneumatic tyres. The bicycles were old and battered, but I couldn't hide my pleasure. Riding a bike was another reminder of my life at home. For the first time in years, I had privacy, at least during my trip through the countryside. I felt virtually free. My only problem was getting used to bike riding on the left side of the road. I pedalled my bike and appreciated the quiet and the farm dogs that trotted along and kept me company. This was the most freedom I'd had since I was drafted. I savoured my independence even more than food. On Sundays, we could relax on the town square. Men, women and girls showed up in kilts and regalia and sang and danced to folk music played on fiddles and accordions. The music and dancing gladdened our hearts. We had grown up with regional folk music. But our former nemeses in North Africa, the bagpipers, sat on street corners and played for coins. The wheezy wine still triggered a swish of adrenaline in our guts. The pipers would never get a coin out of us. Otto, Werner and I were drinking tea outside at a cafe one Sunday and smiling at the girls when I blurted out, Girls don't want anything to do with me no matter where I am. I'm always dressed wrong. First, I was in a German uniform in Denmark, then in a US POW uniform in America, and now in an ugly black uniform here. I'm sick of being an outcast. I might as well be a leper. Otto responded to my outburst. Pretty girls won't give me the time of day either, and I'm a good-looking guy. We laughed at him as we ogled girls' folk dancing, bodies held straight as ballerinas, legs kicking gracefully. Their pleated plaid skirts rippled as they jumped between the blades of swords laid crosswise on the ground. Man, I really like pleated skirts, I said, as I watched the girls' skirts flip with leaps and turns. Otto couldn't stand it any more. Can't we go somewhere else? How much money have you guys got? We can go to the movies or to a soccer game. I had read entertainment notices in the camp. We threw our money together and came up with enough for a movie. From then on, we didn't try to mingle with the townsfolk. It was too discouraging. Instead, we looked for entertainment. One Sunday, when Otto, Werner and I ran out of money, we watched a game from high up in trees overlooking the field. We must have looked like big black crows. Someone from the town not he said to us up there and invited us in. I was touched at the gesture. We sat in the stands watching a soccer game just like we used to at home. We felt like normal young men for a change. On one of my free weekends, I was a few minutes late getting back. A guard started threatening me about restricting future passes. If you Brits hadn't stolen my watch, I would have been here on time. I thought. In the past, I would have blurted it out. Instead, I could only bide my time and pray for the day I would be free. We never knew when or where bottled up anger against us would reveal itself. When the pastor of the local Presbyterian church invited POWs to Sunday services, he didn't first ask his parishioners how they felt about Germans were shipping with them. He should have. Werner and I were just starting up the church steps when parishioners at the top of the stairs stared us down. They made it plain that they didn't want us there. We turned around and left before the service started. After that, we didn't try to go to church. Not even for Christmas until a Roman Catholic priest invited us to midnight mass on Christmas Eve 1946. Otto was thrilled because he was Roman Catholic. Werner and I wanted to be there, even though we were Protestants. I didn't know that the priest had invited a German POW with a fine baritone voice to sing the beautiful hymn Ave Maria. For the first time in years, we were in a real church, a fine old Scottish kirk. Before my misting eyes, former foes, Germans and Scots, Catholics and Protestants, filled up the pews for worship. 
All my stress and worry left me as the Holy Spirit entered my heart and mind and gave me the most sublime feeling of hope and love, a soul-rending religious experience. Even today, the memory evokes the same feelings that comforted me that miraculous night. Many years later, I named my American-born son Kirk. After Christmas, the POWs seemed more relaxed and willing to adjust to Scotland. When the Scots realised how well we were cooperating, they gave us bigger and better rations. In the morning, we got a big bowl of oatmeal with sugar and milk. At noon, the farmers' wives served us the same hearty dinner they served their husbands. Sometimes we ate with the hired help. At other times, we were served separately. The scene reminded me of my easygoing sister Erica's description of her land yard, when she and other teenage girls were ordered off to work on German farms. She didn't mind the hard work, and she liked the fresh food and excellent cooking in the country. The plain menu served to us was far from gourmet, but it was filling. Boiled potatoes, turnips, or carrots slathered with cream gravy, and a hunk of boiled mutton or chicken were typical meals. I heard men complaining about the quality, but I was glad to just be replete. I felt like my old self again, especially since I was finally in contact with my family. The representative of the International Red Cross let me complain about the aggravating situation regarding letters to and from our loved ones. I told him that I hadn't received any mail since the end of the war in May of 1945. I said that I was one of many POWs punished for refusing to sign cards handed out by the Americans that stated, A former member of the beaten Wehrmacht is searching for his next of kin. He gave me a non-incriminatory Red Cross card to sign so that I could get mail. I waited for it with my usual impatience. Grief, not joy, throbbed through my heart as I read my first letter from home. I'm sorry to tell you this, dear Haino, but after our shoe shop was bombed out, your Uncle Hanny got so depressed that he couldn't even eat his reduced rations. He died of malnutrition last Sunday. When I ripped open my second letter, I was overjoyed to find that my parents and my sister Erica had survived the bombings and strafings. My father had remained in the police. Erica had been in the German Air Force, similar to the US WAX. She joined a group that fled from the island of Rugen in the Baltic to Czechoslovakia and on to Bavaria. She was briefly a US POW. She returned home on a coal train, since no civilian train service existed. My mother wrote that Erica looked so funny when she emerged from the train covered in black suit from head to foot. I was happy that she was home safe. She had even given them something to laugh about. Her duties were over. Yet for me, there was no end in sight. My sister knew more about farm work than I did. I had never been on a German farm, let alone a Scottish one. Except for my short stint with Mexican migrant workers in the onion fields of Texas, I had no experience. Now I was expected to pitch in with every task. Scottish farmers laid aside their animosity toward Germans and were glad to have another pair of hands. They trained up on your foot, laddie. It will blacken your nail, they cautioned. But it happened once, and I hobbled around for a week. Watch those horns, laddie, the farmers warned. They can put your eye out. I gave the long, curved horns a wide berth. I tried to talk to the cows to keep them calm. Scottish border collies fascinated me most. Farmers bragged about their dogs and told me that they were the smartest on earth. I didn't doubt it when I saw the dogs at work. The farmers could send a pair of them out by themselves to bring home the cows. When sheep needed to be brought in, I got to see the collies in action. They crouched unseen in the grass until they jumped up to chase after wayward sheep. They followed directions from their masters, who used hand signals or whistles. The farmers were lucky to have such smart and cooperative dogs and the help of obedient POWs. Farmers taught me to use a milking machine on the cows, to dock the tails of lambs, and to shear the sheep. I learned to harness horses to two-wheeled carts and to bring in hay, barley and oats. I dug thousands of potatoes, toddies, from the cold earth. My frost-bitten hands grew huge. On the cold and windy Scottish moors, I used a unique device, a peat cutter, 
to slice thick, carpet-like rectangles of peat to fuel Scottish hearths. Loneliness was ever-present, but life for the time being felt safe and uncomplicated. At night, our two Scottish guards would occasionally check to see that all of our bunks were occupied. I thought that this was rather unnecessary until I learned that some of the older Poes actually managed to find Scottish girlfriends. I wondered where they found women who would want them. The men were dressed just as badly and were just as poor as the rest of us. The Romeos cleverly stuffed their mattresses with more straw in the shape of a man while they were out. Still too shy to approach a girl, their nocturnal trysts were something I could only dream about. I didn't expect to get to know a girl until I was back in Germany. On one farm, when I introduced myself to the Brown family, I had no reason to suspect that I was in for plenty of romantic complications. Bob Brown was a large, dark-haired, capable man around forty. He and his wife had a daughter, Tamara, who was my age. She was just leaving for work, a bonny lass with pretty chestnut hair bobbing as she bicycled down the lane. I watched her leave, rather wistfully, I'm sure. My expression was probably not lost on her mother, Betty, a slender brunette in her late thirties. She looked at me as no other woman had looked at me before. I bowed and shook her hand, since I was a polite German boy. But I trembled. When Bob motioned for me to join him in the barn, I felt relieved. I stepped inside the building. Ach, I said, hopped outside and held my nose. The stench of urine and manure nearly knocked me over. Bob laughed at my reaction. Don't worry, you'll get used to it, lad, he said. Little did I know that one of my jobs would be to shovel out the barn. I got used to it. Bob demonstrated the use of his milking machines and pointed out which cows were to be milked. After several days, he was satisfied that I could manage. He left, saying that he was headed for a far-off field. Suddenly, Betty appeared in rubber boots, reaching around me and trying to help. She giggled as my hand brushed hers. I could feel her breath on the back of my neck. When I whirled around, she pretended that she lost her balance, and I had to catch her before she fell into the manure trough. She put her face in mine and said, You're handsome. I love your blue eyes. I thought she must be crazy. When my chores were done, I hopped on my bike and tried to make sense of what had happened as I pedalled back to camp. I was so embarrassed that I didn't tell anyone. Within a few days, I was sent there again. By this time, Betty had figured me for the blushing, bumbling youth I was. She replaced her rambunctious behaviour with a calm and sweet demeanour. She looked pretty. I hoped that this was her way of being friendly. She told me what a good job I was doing and how happy she was to have a young, strong man about the place. She hugged me. Never having been touched like that by a woman before, I felt new, spine-tingling sensations. That day, I pedalled away, singing. The gloomy road I trundled to the farm now seemed a bright and easy path. I hadn't felt so good in ages. The next time I pedalled to the brown farm, I felt thrills of anticipation. I couldn't wait to sit next to Betty and to chat with her after the chores were done. Private talks with females were a rare treat. Betty gave me several kisses on the cheek, then peeked to see how I was handling it. I was putty in her hands until she pounced on me in the haymow. She planned her manoeuvre well. Her husband wouldn't be home for hours. Conflicting thoughts went through my head. I wasn't sure what she was up to. Was she planning on adultery? While these thoughts clanged in my head, another thought took precedence. I had escaped the war practically unscathed. How ignominious it would be if I were killed or injured by a jealous husband. I lurched out of the haymow like a bumbling boy, feeling Betty staring hatefully at my back. My bicycle carried me to my camp, where I vowed I would never return to the brown farm. Now... I could see how POWs got their girlfriends. From then on, I switched jobs with other POWs and tried to forget about Betty. Farm work was exhausting, but I tried for larger farms with other men, where there was a spirit of camaraderie that I liked. Luckily, I met up with Otto and Werner again. Let's see who can get done the fastest, I would say. Otto was stronger, but I was quicker. 
Werner always tried to think of other ways to do the work. Sometimes his experiments exasperated me, but sometimes they were an improvement and we did it his way. Pretty soon the rest of the POWs got into the spirit of the contests. We found out who could pick the most potatoes, who could cut the most peat, and who could shear the most sheep. The excitement made the day go faster. The Scots enjoyed watching us. On their rest breaks, they singled me out for entertainment because I spoke a cultured schoolboy English. They tried to get me to pronounce Scottish words. They would say, repeat after me, laddie. It's a brubrecht moonlecht tonecht. I had no trouble with their throat-clenching sounds. German has a lot them. Most Scots tried to trip me up with the name of a tiny town. Say this one, laddie, Ochte Muchti. I could pronounce it, much to their amazement. It's now the middle name of my Scottish-bred golden retriever. Scots, pows and Irishmen looked forward to an hour's rest for dinner. During harvest time, farm wives served bounteous meals. I ate and chatted with Irish migrant labourers who went from place to place just as the Mexican migrants do in the United States. The Irish weren't treated any better than the Mexican labourers here. Their beds were worse than ours. They stretched out on potato boxes in the barns. When I first met the Irishmen, I toyed with the idea of escaping to the Irish Republic. Some of them offered to help me. They didn't like the British, but they worked in Great Britain because they needed the money. When I proposed my escape plan, Werner told me point blank, I've already had all the excitement I can stand. Count me out. Otto was all for it, but he got cold feet the night we were ready to escape. I don't speak much English. What if we get stranded somewhere? We could be thrown in jail. That would have been the last straw. Otto was right. Soon afterward, I knew from letters and newspapers that my home city was under British occupation. They would have questioned my return from Ireland rather than from the United Kingdom. Little did I know that freedom was just around the corner, about 18 months after our arrival in the United Kingdom. We heard the rumour that German POWs in England were dropping leaflets from trucks on the way to their jobs, stating, Britain, send your slaves home, the war is over. I kept an eye out on the roadsides. I wanted to see one of those leaflets myself, but I never found one. Although we had no connection with other camps, this idea seemed to be spreading, and I believe it turned the British public opinion in our favour. Finally, by 1947, preparations to send us home began with a reclassification of German POWs. Once again, we were organised into groups. Group 1 white. Men with proven membership and activity in pre-Hitler Democratic parties. Group 3, black. The SS, identified by their blood groups, A, B or C, tattooed under their arms. Group 2, grey. Politically indifferent. The majority fell into this group, including my friends and me. Our group was subdivided based on length of captivity. I was in group number 12, the North African Campaign. Airmen, submarine and other naval personnel captured earlier were in groups 1 to 11. This time it was for real. I was sure of it. Yet others were not as trusting. Some of them couldn't stop throwing cold water on my excited chatter. What makes you so sure? sneered an old guy of about 30 named Gerhardt. This could be another plot to enslave us somewhere else. Why are you so suspicious? I asked him. I'm not, I'm a realist, hissed Gerhardt. I ignored him, I was so excited I could hardly stand it. I was 23 years old and had been gone from home for more than five years. We greys with low group numbers were sent back to the same camp in Liverpool where we had our surprise landing in March of 1946. They called us, assembled us, herded us on trucks, ordered us off the trucks and loaded us onto a train under heavy British armed guards with fixed bayonets. I whispered to Otto, Are they crazy? Why would we try to rebel or to escape now? When we disembarked at Peterborough, near London, a lone RAF, Royal Air Force, guy appeared. He was unarmed and kept his hands in his pockets. I translated his orders. He said, 
Just line up and follow me. I rolled my eyes at Otto. Does anyone in charge know what they're doing? Otto muttered. The RAF man led us to a deserted barracks that held beds and the ubiquitous little stove in the middle of the room. Low mutterings became louder and more intense. One of the men angrily looked over at the RF guy and yelled, What's this all about? What's going on? Then I spoke up in English and tempered his words a little. Are we supposed to work for the RAF now? No answer. The RAF man casually turned his back on us and ambled out the door. No one could sleep that night. Bitter old guys like Gerhardt ranted and raved and sounded homicidal. My buddies and I turned our backs on them. We looked out the windows and talked our problem to death. All we could really do is wait for an RAF officer to show up. The next day, one appeared. I expected him to tell us we would be leaving right away. Instead, he started talking about our work assignments. I snapped to attention. What? What's he talking about, Haino? Otto swore under his breath. What a blow! I looked at Werner. If he'd had a gun, I think he would have killed himself. My old heckler, Gerhardt, was standing right behind me. See, I told you so. There was a lot of mumbling among our men. Are we betrayed again? I wondered. I got up my courage to raise a question. Why were we shipped here after we were scheduled for discharge? The officer said, Really? I'll check into the matter with your old camp, I promise. When he left, I translated his words to dejected ears. Total disillusionment radiated through the barracks. We were in for another restless night. Otto, Werner and I couldn't stop talking about it. Someone just made a mistake, that's all, I said, trying to convince myself as much as Werner. He was overcome, sitting with his head on his knees. We should have made a break for it when we could, Heino, Otto said quietly. I could hear the babble of men's voices arguing over what they had just heard. I felt used and betrayed. Our black garb felt like mourning. All of my excitement and enthusiasm was stripped away like the wool I sheared from Scottish sheep. After lights out, I felt meek as a lamb. I put my fate in God's hands. The officer finally came back the next day. He stood stiffly before us to announce, You are not supposed to be here. There has been some kind of error. I grinned from ear to ear, hopped up and down, and watched Otto and Werner when I translated his little speech. I thought I heard a communal exhale. I grabbed Otto and pounded him on the back. Congratulations, we're free at last. We grabbed Werner and thumped him too. I saw other hugs and hearty backslaps. This had to be it. True to his word, the officer organised us for departure. A large group of us was sent by train to the camp we had passed through twice, once upon arrival and once after leaving the work camp in Scotland. Soon afterward, we joined a second group for another train ride, to the port of Horwich in Essex, England. Now all the POWs believed that we were really going home. Even Gerhardt, the heckler, looked pleased. From there we were ferried across the North Sea to a port city of the Netherlands, Hook van Holland. At that point we were transferred to the familiar German freight cars for the trip into Germany and a discharge camp in Munster Lager, near Lüneburg. This was a former German army camp taken over by the British Army of the Rhine. At this time, August of 1947, it was a military discharge point for German soldiers. Men who'd been mustered out handled our military discharge. Otto, Werner and I shook hands in the early morning of a late summer day, saying we'd meet again. It never happened. We didn't fully comprehend the silent battle of Servival that regared in Germany a grim free-for-all fought by every man, woman, and child. We joined our families in the fiercer struggle for enough food, a roof over our heads and a change of clothes. The deprivation went on for years and took its toll on our psyches. In a final flurry of plaid kilt, a Scottish officer signed my discharge. Then one of our German ex-soldiers handed me a small discharge allowance. This is for your bus fare home, and here's a little package of food for your trip, a loaf of bread and a can of corned beef. It's not much after what everyone's been through, 
he said, but it should get you home. Goodbye and good luck. I counted my marks, roughly three and a half dollars American. One dollar for each year of my captivity. Freedom, I needed to stop and thank God for my deliverance through seven countries. My faith and my intuition had guided me toward the right decisions at the right time. Another thought took shape. God had sparred me for reasons only he could know. I heeded toward the British truck that was pointed out. I realized I would be home before dark. About an hour after the truck left Munster, I jumped off at the town from which I left for North Africa, Lubeck. Once a medieval city of fairy tale romance and charm, it was barely recognizable. Cataclysmic bombings had raised the city, leaving only the ancient city hall and the fabled Holston city gate, embellished by twin peaked caps. They stood like sentinels over the apocalyptic city. Like the city, I was no longer the same. Provincial, innocent, and naive, I had been forced into the mold of a skeptical, sarcastic, fearless man. I no longer respected Germans in authority. From Lübeck, I boarded a German postal bus to Kiel. The trip took about two hours. I looked grimy. My only clothing was my threadbare, black-dyed U.S. Army uniform. I'd worn it every day for farm work for a year and a half, and I despised it. A realization hit me. I had obeyed my last order. I was a civilian and an adult. I could do anything I wanted within my meager resources. My first decision was the same one that had been on my mind since leaving Germany, to find my family. Although we corresponded without censorship while I was in the United Kingdom, I didn't really know how they had fared. It was obvious that their letters were written solely to cheer me up. They didn't mention any problems, like many families of POWs did. My mother ended each letter with blessings and Auf Wiedersehen, until we meet again. My folks were not aware that I was back in Germany and on my way home. I wondered how they were faring. Was Nietzsche right? Was dich nicht umwirft, macht dich stärker. What doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Childhood under the Nazis. World War I, the war to end all wars, came to an end in 1918. Only two decades later, on September 1st, 1939, the first shots of what was called the Second Great War were fired by a German armoured ship, the Schleswig-Holstein, at a depot in Gdynia, Poland. My bus to Kiel lurched over potholes and swerved around rubble. I took a window seat and gazed with melancholy at a devastated landscape that had once been as charming as scenes in a fairy tale book. After a while, I couldn't force myself to look any more. As we drew closer to my home on the sea, memories flooded over me like an unstoppable tide. 1930, mother hands me a huge paper cone full of candy. For this, my first day of school, I'm dressed in my Sunday best, a herringbone tweed jacket and knickerbockers. Parents line up their sons, holding similar cones, for school pictures. We're posed outdoors on a warm, sunny day. I do my best to stand still for the photographer. I'm so excited. I can hardly wait for school again tomorrow. I'll be back in that classroom full of books, maps, and a globe. I hop up and down. Will I get my clash cap tomorrow? I ask mother. She nods and smiles. Of course you will. I know you were a very good boy today. Will mine be blue, mama? Last year, first grade boys got blue ones. Unlike the American school system, German public schools segregated boys from girls and educated them in separate schools. Students in each grade were identified by the colour of their caps. Mother and I walked back to the Stark Shoe Company, the shop that she ran with her brother Johannes, who went by the nickname of Honey. He was a master craftsman of custom-made boots and shoes. Their customers were ordinary Germans who walked for miles every day over cobblestone streets. Sturdy, supportive, custom-fitted shoes were a necessity. I couldn't wait to show Uncle Hanny my big cone. Look, Uncle, see what I've got. Would you like some candy? You're growing up so quickly. Pretty soon you'll be helping us with our business, he said with a chuckle. Pay close attention to your arithmetic. We're going to need a new bookkeeper any day now. 
We waited for my elder sister, Erica, to join us for lunch, since schools were in session for half a day, from eight until noon. Soon, Erica bounced in the door, full off her usual good cheer. The grown-ups put a closed sign on the door, and we claimed to our third-floor apartment for lunch. Mother carried bowls of food out to a table on the balcony, and Erica followed with plates and glasses. My job was to set the silverware and napkins. A striped awning covered our big balcony and sheltered the potted plants. Flower boxes with geraniums and hanging vines beautified the railing. The balcony was our favourite place for lunch and dinner. I chattered happily with Erica about school, asking her questions that I hadn't thought of before. I never dreamed that the classroom that looked so inviting that day would be so forbidding the next. The schoolmaster got down to his highly structured lesson plans when first grade officially began. Even though I was a quick learner, I was caned for misbehaviour. Today, I would have been labelled hyperactive. Then, I was just another jittery little boy who struggled to comply with the teacher's exacting methods. Homework became a dreaded chore instead of a gateway to the knowledge I had dreamed about. Before supper, Erica and I put our books on the dining room table. She calmly went about her studies. I was so nervous I didn't know where to start. Martha tried to calm me down. What do you think will be your favourite subject? German? All right, let's start with German. First you must start to read, then you'll practice writing the alphabet. After that we'll do your arithmetic. She shuffled the pages in my German book and started at the introduction. Germans speak many regional dialects and several forms of Low German. I knew that already. Every time Mother met someone new, she identified their region by their dialect. Pretty soon, I could pick out some dialects too. Mother looked up from my book and asked me if I knew who Martin Luther was. I knew the answer to that. Yes, he was the founder of our Lutheran church. She read on. Martin Luther, a native of our country, a Roman Catholic monk, university professor, and a religious reformer, developed our national written language. Until he came along, we didn't have one, she said. She got up and brought our family Bible to the table. Luther translated the Holy Bible from Latin into the Middle German dialect, the one we speak, that we now call High German. After he completed the translation, he arranged for the Holy Bible to be printed. The first printing press was invented by another German, Johannes Gutenberg. Martin Luther called printing God's highest and most extreme act of grace. And here is our Bible to prove it, she said, as she laid her hand on top of it. Mother and father spoke both low and high German. We were taught in high German, although many Keelers spoke low German at home. Fortunately, my family spoke high German with my sister and me. This made learning to read easier, since all of the printed matter was in high German. But learning to write did not go as smoothly. I spent tedious hours in elementary school trying to write an acceptable German script, only to have it fall out of favour by my teen years. The script was replaced with a simpler style of cursive, and we had to learn to write all over again. Mastering reading was much easier. Books helped me escape my narrow little world and eased my sickliness. Mother blamed my physical problems on the British blockade. She believed that her starvation during World War I caused my ill health. As an infant, I had been diagnosed with vitamin deficiencies and rickets, and she dosed me with foul-tasting supplements. I had overcome most of the effects of rickets by the time I started school, but Mother wasn't taking any chances. Each day, I whined when she gave Erica and me cod liver oil, the preventative for rickets. Please don't make me take it, Mama. It makes me sick. It won't make you sick. It will make you well. Be a good boy now and take your medicine like your sister does. I still gag at the thought of that oily, fishy odour. My sister, four years older and glowing with good health, didn't mind the taste. I used all kinds of delay tactics so that my mother would have to leave the kitchen to get ready for work. Then Erica would swallow my spoonful of cod liver oil as well as her own. 
With wide-eyed innocent faces, we showed mother our empty spoons. Look, all gone. My petite blonde mother, Ellie, was born across the border in Krusau, Denmark. She excelled in organisation, money management, housekeeping and cooking. From an early age, my sister and I went shopping with her and helped with household tasks. We loved to visit mother's vast group of relatives in Hamburg. She was the youngest of 13 children. Her business partner, Hani, was one of those in the middle. Bachelor Uncle Hani slept in the parlour, which was closed off by sliding wooden doors. Tall, thin and balding, he suffered from asthma and arthritis. He never tried to get sympathy. Instead, he lived like a hermit and only came out for meals and to listen to the family radio. He talked to me and my sister more than to anyone else, since he seemed to enjoy our childish prattle. When he heard my father sprinting up the stairs after work, Honey quickly left for the parlour. Father exuded a vibrant charge of energy. He brought the daily newspaper and read it while he listened to radio newscasts. Politically, Honey and my dad didn't agree. Honey was probably a pacifist. I never thought much about my uncle's political leanings, yet I realised later that his observations of the political scene were unfailingly correct. My short, muscular, dark-haired father, Detlef, was a policeman who wanted to believe what the government told him. Papa was born in Kiel and spent most of his life there. As a law officer, he was compulsive about keeping on top of things locally, nationally and internationally. Papa was fast-moving, fast-talking and tough. As a parent, he had high expectations and demanded instant obedience. He was a highly intelligent history and political buff and talked incessantly while he poked nearby companions in the arm to make a point. Although he never backed down from an argument or a fight, he could also be funny and the life of a party. He had a vast repertoire of songs that he sang for company, stretching both arms out to get the maximum affect. As a soldier, he managed to come out of World War I with only minor injuries. As a champion soccer player, he wanted me to be like him and placed me on sports teams, only to have me dash his expectations. My weak muscles and lack of coordination threw me on the sidelines. Papa thought I was a sissy. I'll give you money for a new bicycle if you get into a fist fight with another boy, he said. I had no desire to fight, and I never hit anyone, even though it would have pleased my dad. The adults in our family truly enjoyed children. My sister Erica was a sturdy child with bright blue eyes and thick blonde braids. She was sweet, quiet and eager to please. On the other hand, I was excitable and noisy and drove them all crazy with questions. They told each other that I kept them entertained. I was a high-strung, spindly, dark blonde boy with blue eyes and protruding ears that my playmates teased me about. I, too, was eager to please my family. Each of us had to do our share of work to keep our apartment maintained and supplied. Each day, my mother devised a daily plan and discussed it with my father. This included who would do what before anyone set off on a specific task. All five of us were included. Plans kept everything clear, avoided a lot of argument and prevented any duplication of effort. Our parents shared a sense of humour that could make humdrum events fun and squeeze the best out of the worst situation. These qualities got them through two wars. Their way of living has been my guide. Our spacious apartment was in a turn-of-the-century building with high ornamental ceilings of stucco and lustrous carved woodwork. Between floors was a lavatory for each cluster of apartments. In the stairway of each floor was the energy-saving European-timed light switch, still in existence. The switch gives you three minutes to reach the next landing before the light goes out, hopefully after you flip the switch for the next flight. This was torture for my slow, arthritic Uncle Hani, who hated to be caught in the dark groping up the stairs. Every night after work, he and my mother rang the bell to our apartment. My sister and I would run down to meet them and help carry all the shopping up the stairs, flipping switches for Uncle as we climbed. German grown-ups had to shop every day due to lack of refrigeration. Men carried briefcases and women carried shopping bags for their treks after work to all the little food shops. Their clothes showed that they were city folk. 
Regardless of whether they were working or shopping, my mother and my uncle always appeared well-dressed and in fashion. In winter, they wore wool suits and coats with felt hats. In summer, they put on gabardine suits and straw hats. On their feet were their custom-made shoes. Once inside, everyone rested their feet in slippers. Each room in our apartment was furnished with heavily carved dark walnut furniture that had been passed down through generations. Our overstuffed sofas and chairs were decorated with fancy embroidered doilies. Some of the furniture was lost when our first apartment was bombed. The bedrooms held antique armoires, self-standing wash basins for daily sponge baths, and single beds. Single beds were pushed side by side for couples. Luxurious as they were, our feather beds required daily maintenance. They were pounded, fluffed up, and hung out the window to air. Streets had the look of carnival early in the morning when brightly coloured feather beds hung from bedroom windows and balconies. Tile stoves heated the living room and dining room. These were colourfully decorated works of art that burned wood and coal. We learned to carry up loads of coal from the basement in our best clothes without getting sooty. The kitchen in which we helped prepare meals had a pantry with stone crocks to keep food cool and a coal-burning stove with a three-burner gas stove on top. The kitchen table held basins underneath for washing dishes. At the start of a meal, water was heated in a teapot for washing the china and silverware afterward. Heating water for the laundry was a different matter. Each tenant was assigned a wash day. On our day, we took the clothes down to a building behind the apartment house that contained a community water heater and a ringer washing machine. If the weather was fair, we helped ring it and hang it out to dry. However, more often than not in our coastal city, it was raining. Then we divided the laundry into baskets for clothes and baskets for sheets and towels. We carried some of the heavy wash baskets to a nearby shop that ran our linen and damask through a heated mangle until they were dry and perfectly pressed. When that was done, we tackled the other heavy baskets full of clothes. We carried them up four flights of stairs to our attic to hang them up to dry. My sister and I loved the attic because it was like having our own gymnasium. We could run and slide across the hardwood floors to our heart's content. We especially liked Sundays, because Sunday was a national day of rest. For youngsters, it was the national day of church and play. In the morning, Mother took us to Sunday school at our neighbourhood Lutheran church, St Matthew's. Erica and I were baptised and confirmed there. When we were older, Mother also took us to confirmation class for a three-year study of Luther's small catechism. Luther wrote the Catechism in 1529, and Lutheran children around the world study the same Catechism book today. Catechism class seemed like a gruelling assignment on top of my dreaded homework, but Mother kept reminding me of generations of Ericssons and Starks, who were confirmed. They had memorised the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the names of books according to their order in the Bible, Bible verses, and the meaning of the sacraments. They did it, and I could do it too. Mother added for further emphasis, You wouldn't want to disappoint your grandmother, would you? Unfortunately, my grandmother didn't live to see my confirmation. According to the prevailing custom, she was laid out in our living room, where the family kept watch until burial arrangements were made. My sister and I were afraid, as most children would be in such circumstances. I had a lot of questions for my parents, and their answers only generated more questions. They did what anyone in their right mind would do. They ignored me. Three years later, when everyone in my class passed the written and oral examinations, we participated in the annual Lutheran confirmation ceremony in our church. As we knelt at our first Holy Communion, we knew that similar ceremonies were held that Sunday throughout Germany. We had no inkling that this tradition would soon be broken. After church, our family went home for dinner and then for walks in our wooded neighbourhood park. In summer, we had picnics at the edge of a lake in the centre. A clutch of swans captivated us. We saved breadcrumbs from our picnics to offer them and felt honoured when they gracefully swam to us for treats. On summer weekends, we rode our bicycles to the beach for long, wonderful, relaxed days on the Baltic Sea. 
On holidays, we rode trains to Lübeck and to Hamburg. We jumped off the train and hopped on Hamburg's excellent subway system to see our many cousins. While we played and the women cooked, the men discussed current events and politics. My father and his brother, Uncle Willie, got into loud arguments because Willie was a social democrat. Yet no matter how mad they got, they remained close even though they didn't agree. Shush, Willie, his wife, Hedwig, would tell him, and to her oldest son, Heinz, she would say, Why don't you take Heino and Erika to the harbour to see the big ocean-going ships? Heinz was only too glad to collect money for treats and to be our guide. He took us to the harbour, the Elbe Tunnel, at that time for pedestrians, and the famous Hagenbeck Zoo. The zoo was the first in the world to recreate large native environments for each herd of animals and to surround their habitats with moats rather than cages. Later on in the war, even the zoo was bombed. We heard that the primates who lost their shelters went running to knock on the zookeeper's door for help. Another brother of my father's, a six-foot-seven, three-hundred-pound giant named Hans, took me along on trips in his delivery van. He enjoyed my lively chatter. We often went to my favourite place in Kiel, the docks along the harbour. Anchored there were smaller craft, mostly coastal freighters and excursion boats to Sweden and Denmark. Hans taught me to recognise flags of many nations while we watched the sailors on duty. Like my father before me, I was interested in the geography and history of these countries, and I collected their stamps. The countries and their natives fascinated me. It became a goal of mine to tour foreign countries as soon as I grew up. I reached my goal more quickly than I wished. Politics began to impact my life when I was only nine years old. The 1932 election campaigns erupted in street battles downtown. Police on foot, on horseback, or driving armoured cars tried to keep order. My father was among them. When the streets erupted with frenzied fighters, he and his fellow officers had to keep order with trained German shepherds. The Red Communist Veterans Organisation, which wore grey windbreakers and marched while playing oriental-sounding instruments called Schalmein, clashed with the Nazi stormtroopers. In my neighbourhood, people showed their political loyalties by displaying their party flags out of their windows. The imperial flag of the former German Reich was for the German Nationalist People's Party, DNVP, the Conservatives. A three-arrow flag, called the Iron Front, was for the Social Democratic Party. They were the majority and still exist today. Rarely did the swastika of the Nazis or the hammer and sickle of the communists appear in my neighbourhood. My father brought a spark of excitement every night when he burst in the door with news of the streets. I was frightened by the risks he took. He tried to explain to me, a little boy, why he had to do his job. I work for our city and for our state. Our national government is in Berlin. It changes almost every month and people fight about it, he said. By November, three large blocks emerged. He named them for me and told me what they stood for. He made it clear that he didn't trust the Communist Party, even though there were lots of communists in Kiel. When I was older, I understood that the communists attracted the shipyard unions because of widespread unemployment and the economic depression that followed the crash on Wall Street. The Nazi Party and the German Nationalist Party were the other blocs. The latter bonded with the Nazis, which gave them the majority. Rapidly changing politics excited my father. He was the only one in the family who smoked, and he spewed ashes, sparks, cigarette butts, and matches everywhere as he discussed political events with whoever would visit. Hitler was appointed Reich Chancellor, he exclaimed after hearing a radio broadcast, and von Papen, the nationalist, is now the vice-chancellor. He said that he thought that they hoped to save Germany from communism. History proved him right. Later, I understood that the nationalists intended to rein in the Nazis in order to use them for their own purposes. I will never forget January 30th, 1933, Hitler's appointment to Chancellor by President von Hindenburg. From our apartment window, my sister Erika and I watched the Nazi torchlight parades. We could hear the music of the marching bands, men singing rousing marching songs and the stomp, stomp, stomp of their hard-heeled jackboots on the cobbles. 
This was exciting until Uncle Hani came to the window and put his hands on our shoulders. Haino and Erika, this looks like fun to you, but Nazis are not fun. They will never do you any good. They will never do our country any good. Your father is out on the streets tonight, controlling the crowds. Will Papa be all right? Erika asked. Of course he will. Your father is always all right. He's smarter and tougher than any Nazi in Kiel, said Uncle Hani in his soft voice. But I want you to remember something. No matter how high the Nazis go or how powerful they become, might does not make right. The Nazis had just begun. Soon they dominated the news. Every night, as was our custom, the men in the family read the evening paper while sitting by the radio, waiting for the six o'clock news. A month after the parade, we heard a frightening message. The German parliament in Berlin has gone up in flames, said the announcer. Mother looked startled. I thought that the government would always be here to take care of us, she said. Who did it? I asked my father. He let out wisps of smoke from his mouth and nose before saying, the Nazis blame the communists. Much later, I learned that this gave the Nazis power to push through the enabling law, a temporary suspension of parliamentary government, which instead lasted for the duration of the Third Reich. To enact this new law, the thirty-odd political parties voted themselves out of existence and gave emergency powers to the Hitler von Papen cabinet. Only the Social Democrats remained to vote against it. Such famous persons as Willy Brandt, Kurt Schumacher, the future mayor of Kiel, Andreas Geik, and others bravely cast their votes. Little did I know that I would see the heroic Geik in the future. Each of the men had escape plans. Since they knew they were subject to immediate arrest, they disappeared in Germany and surfaced in the congenial social democratic countries of Denmark and Sweden. In 1945, they returned to form a nucleus for a new democratic Germany. Uncle Hani read about their votes and their vanishing acts in the paper and told me they could have created a better Germany if the Nazis had let them. Back then, I was a child and only able to grasp the most surprising or shocking events. Later on, I realised how the Nazis prepared us children for militarism, as if they were fattening bunnies for a Hazenpfeffer stew. They organised us into groups, groomed us and indoctrinated us. Each group was identified by the colour of its shirts. I never knew the reason for the specific colours chosen for each political group. My sister, then 13 years old, was a member of a Lutheran sports movement who wore the blue shirts. I was impressed with her important look. Their motto was the four Fs, frisch, from, fröhlich, frei, wholesome, happy, pious and free. This group, as well as others, was later merged with the grey shirts, nationalists, and the green shirts, socialists, into the brown shirts of the Hitler Youth Movement. All of these political youth organisations were dissolved when those political parties were eliminated. This also happened to the Socialist Workers' Youth and the Communist Youth Association. Some right-wing organisations, such as the grey-shirted Bismarck Youth, and the Hindenburg Youth, lived on a while longer until they merged with the Hitler Youth, H.J. All of the youth hostels were taken over by the H.J. Because of my vitamin deficiencies and a bout with jaundice, I was sent on school vacations to Lutheran rehabilitation homes in the Hartz Mountains. A month of mountain air and better food were supposed to improve my health. I wrote long letters home, describing my pleasant days there with boys my age. On the other hand, the nurses took the opportunity to expose a use to Nazi propaganda. I forgot about the boring sessions when I got home. I didn't think about it again until I heard the same line of propaganda in the brown shirts. In June of 1934, I turned ten. This was a happy occasion for me, with my cake and candles and everyone in the family singing Happy Birthday, but later I learned that it had been a hideous night in Bavaria. It was called the Night of the Long Knives. The leaders of the stormtroopers had previously demanded a merger with the German army and equal leadership positions. The army officials, mainly the Prussian officers' corps, had scoffed at such notions. The officers were educated gentlemen. 
they considered the stormtroopers mere street brawlers. A conference was arranged in Bavaria for the leaders of the stormtroopers. While they were thus engaged, the Schutzstaffel, SS, surrounded them, dragged them outside, lined them up, and shot them. One of the leaders was a famous World War I captain, Ernst Röhm. The SS treated him differently due to his distinguished status. They ushered him to a private room and handed him a pistol with which to commit suicide. When they saw that he refused to do so, the SS came back and executed him. Much later, I learned that the Nazis had tried to whitewash his execution by labelling Captain Roem a homosexual, a shocking accusation in those days. Homosexuals were being rounded up by the Nazis and sent to concentration camps. Conservative elements that opposed Hitler's initial power bloc were also murdered. Hitler claimed that the murders were accidental. He schemed his way into the favour of German army leaders, especially those in favour of his plans to expand and to strengthen the armed forces. Just two months after my birthday, the radio played a long, slow funeral dirge before announcing the death of President von Hindenburg. The sombre music was played until after the funeral procession. From our windows, high above the street, my sister and I could see black bunting stretching for miles. Directly after the President's burial, funeral music segged into marital music as the offices of President and Chancellor merged. My father was sitting with me when a radio broadcaster announced, Hitler has assumed the title of Leader and Reich Chancellor. His title is now Der Führer. My father jumped to his feet. What will this mean to us? What's going to happen next? He said to no one in particular. He puffed on one cigarette after another as he sat in front of the radio. Militarism spread like the measles. Nazis stomped in endless parades. They expected everyone on the street to stand at attention and to salute them as they strutted by. Uncle Honey came limping home one evening after being roughed up and kicked by the Nazis. He had refused to stand at attention or to salute. My mother went to get some aspirin, while Erica and I ran to get wet cloths to help clean him up. He was shaking. You shouldn't be so stubborn, honey, my mother said. Think of your health. Most of our neighbours were wearing the uniforms of a branch of the National Socialists, NS. Children started wearing Hitler youth uniforms to school. Before, it was forbidden for children to wear uniforms or emblems of a political party to school. Now that the Nazis were on top, they further entrenched their cause among adults and children by encouraging uniforms as a political statement. At the same time, signs of the Depression disappeared. The German economy perked up and we enjoyed a new wave of prosperity.